Hello and welcome. My name is Dubs Weinblatt. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training for Metro New York for Keshet. I'm thrilled to be back as the co-host of season two of Joy and Resilience, Jewish LGBTQ leaders on what sustains us. This season, we are proud to partner with Bechol Lashon, an organization whose mission is to strengthen Jewish identity by raising awareness about the ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity of Jewish identity and experience. I'm excited to introduce to you my co-host for the season, Anthony Russell. Hi, my name is Anthony Russell. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm a performer, composer, and writer of music, mostly in Yiddish, an essayist in a number of Jewish publications, a cultural advocate and activist, and last but not least, very pleased to be joining Dubs Weinblatt as co-host for season two of Joy and Resilience. As LGBTQ Jewish people, and specifically as Jews of color, oftentimes we need to create our own ways of persevering through tough moments. Surviving and thriving in this world has pushed us to create our own store of unique wisdom about resilience, joy, and community. Each episode, Dubs and I will invite a different LGBTQ Jew of color to join us in a thoughtful conversation about what sustains us and keeps us hopeful in a conversation where we can only speak from our own personal lived experiences. Dr. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy and core faculty in women's and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. The author of The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred, she is also a columnist for New Scientists in Physics World. Her research in theoretical physics focuses on cosmology, neutron stars, and dark matter. She also does research in Black feminist science, technology, and society studies. Nature recognized her as one of 10 people who shaped science in 2020, and Essence Magazine has recognized her as one of 15 Black women who are paving the way in STEM and breaking barriers. A co-founder of Particles for Justice, she received the 2017 LGBT Plus Physicist Acknowledgement of Excellence Award for her contributions to improving conditions for marginalized people in physics, and the 2021 American Physical Society Edward A. Boucher Award for her contributions to particle cosmology. Welcome, Dr. Prescott Weinstein. Thank you for having me, and please call me Chanda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome, Chanda. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for being here with us today, Chanda. So in, in an incisive essay recently published from catapult.co, you identified a dynamic, even um, I guess it could be called a certain economy that comes out of not only your personal experiences of being a black femme in the field of science academia, but also from being asked to reflect, recount, and to be a resource in response to those experiences. That being the case, it's actually a relief for me to be able to ask you, instead of disparagements or marginalizations you've experienced in your work as a theoretical physicist, what has given you joy? Yeah, so I still really like doing the work when I get the opportunity to actually focus on it, which I think when I was a junior person before I became a professor, I didn't realize how precious those moments would be because there's so much time that we spend as faculty doing administrative stuff, going to faculty meetings, committee meetings. I am, I really like my meetings with students, but it also means that I'm not calculating during those times. And so when I actually have the moments where I can sit down and just kind of think for myself about science, I still really like that. Sometimes I'm in collaboration meetings with, um, like I've, I've been working on this neutron star project with one of my students and with some collaborators at the university of Amsterdam. And we're, I'm looking at some things relating to dark matter and it involves looking at a dark matter model that was developed by my late postdoc advisor. And it's who was, who was named Ann Nelson. She passed away a couple of years ago, but it's such a reminder of how creative Ann was. And it's really fun to work with her work and to kind of see her brain at work in the work, even though she's no longer with us. And so that, that, that's, a, that's a cool thing. I also actually really love seeing my students at the end of the semester when even if they like complained the whole way at the end of the semester, they're like really competent at whatever I wanted them to learn. I'm, I'm totally one of those professors who's like, if everyone's earned an A, I'm excited to give everyone an A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> That's really cool. I, I'm just imagining um, a group of like adult student, adult students like complaining and being like, oh, but then at the end, like we got this. It's just like a, a, a nice image. Yeah, I think, to think about. 
I think part of it is that the way that um, students are socialized to participate in their education is mm-hmm. very much like tablets are being handed down to them, right? Um, and that, you know, they're just supposed to wait and take things in. And I focus a lot on the idea that, you know, the only way out is through, the only way to really develop the skill set is by working through problems, by working through the material. I want them to do the reading. And that can require a kind of hands-on involvement that they're not used to. Um, and, and I think that because grades are so important and so heavily emphasized that they panic about, am I going to mess this up? Am I not going to get the high grade that I need for my med school application, whatever it is? I hope on the other end, they see that I'm like fair in, in how I handle that because I also try and give them different ways of showing their competency. So everything's not writing on one exam. They have presentations so they can show competency through oral presentation. Um, their final exam is take home. So they only have one timed test and, and, and those kinds of things. So I try and build in different ways for them to be motivated and, and to show off their competency. But I think because of the way that education tends to be delivered, it can be stressful because it's outside of the norm. But I do mm-hmm. think it's better for them, or at least that's what I'm telling myself since those are my classes. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I think those are skills that can be applied to other parts of life and like really important to understand. And I love that idea of the only way out is through, um, which I, I think, think is I a- picked that up from a TV show, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> there's, a, there's a similar, um, Sarah Bareilles has in one of her songs, uh, Uncharted, in a live version, she says something very similar to this. And I thought she made it up. And then she was like, no, I didn't make that up. <laughs> But um, it's just, it's such a powerful way to think of like, you got to get through it, whatever it quote unquote is. I, I, I definitely, I, I think that, that the way that I think about it is I'm often going into the class thinking, yes, there are some things about astrophysics and cosmology. I want them to know those are the last two classes that I've taught, but also there are some skills I want them to have that are, are widely applicable. So the class I taught last semester was a graduate course. And so I wanted the students to feel confident at picking up a research paper on a topic that they didn't know super well and learn how to take pieces of information from it, even if they didn't understand everything that was going on, because that's a really key piece of how we do scientific reading. And so you just need to get used to being confused and grabbing as much as you can from the, the, the muck, what you can recognize, and then just say, here's what I recognize, here's what I don't recognize, I looked it up. And so I wanted them to get comfortable with that. And it had nothing to do with doing it with cosmology, but just, anyway, you can tell I can talk about like pedagogy for a while. So <laughs> I won't hijack the rest of your podcast going on about my class. <laughs> it's interesting though, it's interesting. No, as a student, you want to think that your professor actually cares about your ability to be able to do more than just pass their class, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's absolutely amazing. So in your book, The Disordered Cosmos, you write that your mother, activist, journalist, and radio host, Margaret Prescott, said, quote, people need to know that we live in a universe that is bigger than the bad things that happen to us. And like the first time I read that, I just really felt that in my bones. Um, I think it speaks to one of the themes of, of the show, resilience. So I was curious if you could tell us what the word resilience means to you and from what or where do you happen to find resilience? The first thing that comes to mind for me when I think about resilience is I guess usually I frame this as persistence, but I think they're related, that it's one of the most important qualities that a scientist can have because doing science is living at the boundary of what humans understand and what humans don't understand. So the act of like doing science is really about what we don't know and trying to push that boundary forward. And all you have is questions and tools you've developed answering other questions or that other people have developed and that that have been taught to you that you try and apply to these new questions and hope that you actually are able to push that boundary forward. And, you know, the universe wasn't 
um, didn't evolve with our understanding in mind, whether you believe it was a created thing or whether it just happened or whatever. Uh, human understanding is not like the center of the universe. And so we get knocked down a lot, like uh, where we come up with an idea, it doesn't work. We feel confused. If you feel confused, you're having a very scientist experience. I think it's one way I would put it. And so yeah. a lot of resilience is required. Um, and, you know, I think coming from, from the background that I do, my mom is, was born in Barbados. Her grandmother came to the United States decades before and worked as a domestic servant and sent money home. And basically my, my grandmother was raised by her aunties and this, this very complicated dynamic. And, you know, they, they were only a couple of generations away from enslaved folks that resilience takes on a completely different meaning when you, when you think about it in that context. But I also think that in science, we tend to speak about people from underrepresented and traditionally marginalized groups as being deficient because they are an air quoting outsider in some way to the scientific community. And people don't appreciate that we bring legacies of resilience and persistence to the table that actually sometimes people from majority dominant, power dominant communities don't bring to the table. And that that's actually, not that I wanna say that that's a skill that should be made to serve science, but I think it's just a fact of, of, of who we are in the community, that, that that's part of what comes with that. And so in really significant ways, I think my mom trained me to be a scientist, even though she's an incredible, incredibly uncomfortable doing like any kind of math without a calculator. She's really, yeah, I see you raising your hand. <laughs> yeah. She's, she's really insecure about it. Um, my mom's also like the most fashion forward person. Like she's a total fashionista. She's always the best dressed person at a protest. Like you can just Google her and there's like lots of evidence of this and like Google image search. Um, but she's, I'm realizing that she's actually kind of like physics fashion forward. And that when I was in high school, she was like, neutrinos are so awesome. Have you heard it? Have you been reading about neutrinos, Chanda? And I'd be like, okay, neutrinos, whatever. They're in the standard model. I'm more interested in quarks. And of course, like now I'm like super into neutrinos right now, but I'm like 30 years late behind my mother <laughs> who like claims she can't do math, but already knew which particle was like the awesome particle. Um, so I, I really think like watching my mom as an activist, I don't know, I could do a whole podcast about my mother. Someone really just needs to invite me to talk about my mom for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> she knew that neutrinos would be trending in your timeline. I mean, that's an immense <laughs> amount of vision to have. <laughs> Physics, fashion forward. And, and can, I, can I just share like the tidbit about neutrinos, which is that neutrinos are non-trinary. Um, so there are three different types of neutrino. There's the electron neutrino. There's three different flavors. That's what they're called. There's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. You don't need to know what any of those things mean, except that they're three different flavors. And if one is produced in a nuclear reaction and it just goes flying through space time, they will randomly change flavor. Like the electron neutrino will just become a tau, will just become a muon. And there's like nothing saying, like there's no reaction, nothing touched it and said, you have to become a muon neutrino now or anything like that. So I have, as a, as a queer person, I've been recently like very into the idea of neutrinos as non-trinary. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, you bring up a lot of like parallels of queer identity and race identity in your book. Um, and so I would love to just know, like, what did, what did read, what did write, reading, what, what did writing your book and if you read it back uh, mean to you and how did you learn new things about yourself within that, that experience of writing this book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. What did you learn? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, so actually I had my computer read it to me because I am someone who like, I need to hear how it sounds before I'm like, this piece is like, is, is ready to go. And I actually read like a couple of chapters to myself and I was like, my voice will not stand up to this. So I eventually gave up and had the computer read it to me, but I think next time I will plan better and actually have it read out, read out loud to me. I am. 
so I have this chapter, the anti-patriarchy agender, and it's like a competition between that one and the physics of melanin as being the two hardest chapters for me to write. The physics of melanin was hard because I already had a base for it. I had written an essay in Bitch Magazine that had been published. And in theory, it should have been easy because I was just building on it and expanding it a little bit. But my understanding of like race and race science, I'm, I'm, you know, I work in black feminist science, technology and society studies. And so I was continuously like iterating new research was coming out. Like I, I quote Shea Akil McLean in that chapter. And when I wrote the first draft of the book, Shea Akil's research wasn't even out yet. Hmm. So literally the ground was shifting as I was working through different drafts of the book. The, the anti-patriarchy agenda, I think was different because I think I am still working through what do I want to say to people about being an age under woman and what language do I want to use? Um, I wanted, to, I, I wrote so many pages that got taken out where I was trying to explain to people that just because I'm using this word in one way, it doesn't mean that you can then go tell someone that they have to use it that way, that you can't talk to trans people like that. You can't talk to non-binary people like that. I'm, um, Queerness, as Jose Esteban Munoz says, queerness is futurity. Queerness is in many ways like science at the boundary of what is known and unknown. And it's always sort of in the unknown. And so to write a chapter where you're trying to tell people how to talk about the ever future unknown, it's hard. And I, I felt like a heavy responsibility there. And so also, let me say, like the, my first draft of that chapter was such a mess mess. I sent it to Autumn Kent, who um, is a mathematician. And Autumn sent me an email and was like, look, honey, <laughs> you just need to like, I see some of the things that you're trying to do here, but let me suggest a reorganization. And so let me just shout out Autumn um, for, for really helping me find the voice in, in, in that chapter. Yeah. I don't know. I sort of, I answered a question. I don't know if I answered yours. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I mean, that was, I love the, the comparison of queerness being like science. Um, I guess to, to drill down a little bit of what did writing the book mean to you? I wanted to give a holistic perspective on the doing of particle physics and cosmology. Um, so from my point of view, I really wanted to say there's the things, the facts that we've come to know about particle physics, the standard model of particle physics, quarks, neutrinos, electrons, muons, tau, all the things that I've mentioned already. Then there are the things that we don't know, like dark matter, which is what I work on primarily in, in my physics research. And I also wanted to say that there's this whole social context to it, that science is a social phenomenon. And so, um, I don't know, it was, a, it was in many ways like a very scary thing to do, particularly like any of the academics who are listening know that junior faculty in physics are not supposed to write books. <laughs> like that's something you do when you're like an elder states person of the field traditionally. And so it was professionally risky, although I had great support from my department at the University of New Hampshire. I don't want to make them sound unsupportive. They were actually, I couldn't have gotten away with it without that support. Um, I was really afraid that people would read it and just read for like juicy tidbits that sounded like interesting memoir about, about me and not necessarily because people are particularly interested in me, but because people are interested in me as a representative of a population. I didn't want it to be black and STEM tragedy porn. I didn't want it to be black and STEM tragedy and triumph porn. <laughs> um, so I feel like I was managing a lot of things at the same time. And honestly, I have a hard time with it because I see all the things that I could have done better that I didn't get to you. Mm. Speaking to what you've just sort of outlined, um, this particular season of Joy and Resilience is, is about experiences of queer Jews of color. And I'm wondering if there's been a particular moment or experience that you've had where you felt like these various aspects of your part were being 
embodied or seen all at the same time. Yeah, I think this is maybe like an, an off the wall thing. Kiese Lehman's Long Division, his, his novel, which was released, I want to say the release year was 2013. It's being re-released this June. So I encourage everyone to, to grab a copy. I'm, I'm not giving much away when I say it's about time traveling, black kids and white Jewish kids in Mississippi. And yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I can't. Why do I not? Why do I not know about this? I know. Yeah. You know, I am. I mean, you're going to know about it because I, you know, I, I also actually encourage people to go find the essay. I think it's on Lit Hub where Kiese talks about going and buying back the rights to his books mm. and the journey that he was on. I'm, I'm, and I'm lucky enough to be friends with him. And so I've, I've seen, I've seen what he went through with that. But I read that book around 2013 and figured out that we had a mutual friend and went to that mutual friend and was like, your friend Kiese is a genius. And the friend was like, let me just introduce you all. So I'm not playing telephone with the compliments. <laughs> um, what was powerful for me in that book was that I learned history about white Jews that I didn't understand that gave me a very different perspective on the dynamics between black and, and white Jewish people in the South, which I think is very different from what those of us who grew up, I'm from Los Angeles, but grew up around folks in Brooklyn as well. The dynamics are very different from what they are in the, the, the quote North. And I'm, the other thing was the book was called Long Division and it had like time travel in it, right? And I'm a general relativity expert by training. And so I, it's odd because like none of the kids were black and Jewish, but I think that was a book that was like, Hey, all of these pieces can be in conversation with each other in one place. And I um, I think I only recently told Kiese that, and I actually saw the look of surprise on his face. Like he wasn't expecting me to, 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 to draw that connection. The, the other book I will name is Rebecca Walker's Black, White, and Jewish, which came out, I think, my first year of graduate school. And there were so many parallels between the childhoods that she and I had had, including being raised by like an activist, Black activist, radical mother, and, a, a, and also like lefty, white, Jewish father, and the experience of going between different socioeconomic zones, going between the two households, and um, father having a completely different family that was living like a very different life and feeling like a fish out of water in that environment. Um, and then both of us going to Ivy League schools and having to like navigate being black and Jewish in environments where um, black people couldn't imagine like a black Jew and white Jews couldn't imagine someone who was brown skinned and like was also Jewish and actually like not um, Mizrahi or um, in my experience, people would often accuse me, accuse me, and I say this like of being Palestinian as if that was a problem. Yeah. I have to say as a creative person, I love the fact that you were able to find all these various parts of yourself in other people's work. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the experience that you had of their work, because I think it speaks to the great possibilities that other people's work ha has for us, including, including your own work, you know, the, your, what your work is doing for other people who are reading it. Um, speaking as someone from outside of an academic study of science, I would say quite outside. Um, <laughs> I imagined for myself the prospect of being faced with the seemingly endless span of the cosmos as being something that is very daunting um, and very sort of disorienting. So as someone who regularly is looking into the complex functions uh, behind a phenomena, uh, like behind phenomena like dark matter and space time, what, what gives you hope, <laughs> given that you're, you know, you're surrounded and you're working with all of these things that seem like they're almost like beyond um, understanding, at least to someone like me, like in the midst of all of those really serious things, like what gives you hope? 
You know, the thing is, is that I think science should be fun, particularly like what I do, like particle cosmology, like thankfully nobody's life depends on me not screwing up my calculation today. I am, I'm not a nurse, right? Uh, and so people aren't depending on me in the immediacy like that. I still think that what particle cosmologists do can contribute to nourishing people's spiritual well-being. And so that's not to say that our work isn't important, but it doesn't have that immediate like life or death impact on people. And so I actually said to an undergraduate who's working with me this morning, I'm she had to do some stuff because of the program that she's in that I thought meant she spent a lot of time on the least fun part of doing science first before she spent time doing the fun stuff. And so I said to her, like, now that you're done with that, I want you to try and have fun with this because this is just like a cool thing to be able to do, understanding space time. It's just a really, really cool thing to do. Um, so that said, I think for me, I'm... Um, when I genuinely get hope from realizing kind of our insignificance and preciousness, as I'm paraphrasing Carl Sagan here, and probably the film Contact, I'm, based on his book, I'm, that we are like really on the scale of the universe, like nothing. The stuff that we are made of, like quarks, electrons, was basically mostly what we're made of, um, is a very small fraction of the matter energy content in the universe. The universe, we tend to think of like the stars as like, you know, that's what's out there. That's most of what's out there is stars and gas and, and dust. But actually everything that we can see in the universe only adds up to about 5% of the matter energy content in the universe. So the universe is mostly what we can't see. And there's something really humbling about that, like truly, truly humbling about that. Um, but also, you know, we are the weirdos, we are what's special, we are what's unusual, even if there are like a thousand other, you know, inhabited planets out there or more, we would still be what's unusual and what's special. On a human scale, solidarity gives me hope. I think that solidarity is the, the core principle that the more that we find ways to enact solidarity in our lives, the, the more possibility there is of our survival as a species and the survival of our ecosystems and the ecosystems that we depend on and maybe have too much power over, that there has to be solidarity. And uh, the more we enact that core principle, I think the better we will be. So I always feel hopeful when I see people being in solidarity with each other. I just want to say, I absolutely love the way you talk about what you do. <laughs> because Thank you. it's Yay. very because for someone like me it's very in intimidating i think like the first part of my life i basically considered myself to be enumerate mm -hmm. i was very literate i could read and write and talk but as far as what numbers meant to me and what their relationship was to the world that i was happy to read or talk about it was always very mysterious and it feels like the ways in which you have sort of um, explored these terrains, um, you know, both through you being yourself, but also through your writing has made it a, a, kind of a way in for me to kind of have an emotional experience of these things, in addition to like an intellectual experience uh, of what it is that you do. So, um, thank you. You know, sixth grade Anthony who hated science wants to thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess like, I I will just, you know, throw this back to you a little bit and say, you know, as someone who grew up playing music and dancing, I, I actually like I just want to like shout out the importance of like the performing arts in my development as a scientist. And so I look at you as a musician and I'm like, you do math for a living. <laughs> like, I'm, and so I think part of, you know, I think a lot of people have like math trauma and have had bad experiences with. Um, we are definitely a fixed mindset society instead of a flexible mindset society. We tell people that they are either good at math or they are not good at math. And our definition of math is really narrow. So what would happen if we were saying to that like brilliant kid who can't stop banging on things because they're a percussionist, that like rhythm is a mathematical form, right? So I, I guess like part of it to me is 
reframing our understanding of what counts and who counts. I, th- I think that, that that's, that's all part of the same conversation. I love that so much. I'm, I'm enamored. <laughs> <laughs> You're a mathematician now. <laughs> wow. I did, I did get a B in my last, you know, uh, course of mathematics that I took in college. It was in mathematical concepts. And what I loved about the course was that we really talked about the thinking behind um, various mm. mathematical concepts. And I was like super into that because I love thinking. It's just, you know, the computation was always really hard for me. So I always wondered if there was something to that that suddenly I found this kind of way in that was slightly different than the conventional idea of what, what math was. Like if you talk to theoretical physicists, we all practice our math. Like if you go to my dining table, which should be cleaner than it is, but where I, where I eat breakfast, there is a 1500 page math book next to where I sit. And often on Saturday mornings, I can be found like doing problems from the book that are like that go back to material that I learned in high school or my first year of college. It's a tool and it's something anybody can be taught and to maintain the tool you practice. It's exactly the same as being a musician. It sounds like. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I think we, in a very similar way, we have to get away from the, the genius. Like some people are musical geniuses and some people aren't that like, the people that we articulate as geniuses are usually the people who are just so excited about what they do that they just practice all the time, right? Which definitely my jazz ensemble instructor was constantly grinding this into us <laughs> in high school. Right, that necessity to become like technically proficient so you can suddenly sort of move on beyond kind of what the basics are. But you always need to come back to the basics. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what I've learned, at least in my practice as, as an artist. Mm-hmm. This has been such an amazing conversation. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing with us, Chanda. It was, yeah, it was so lovely. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Joy and Resilience. To learn more about Keshet, a national organization that works for the full equality of all LGBTQ Jews and their families in Jewish life, you can visit them at www.keshetonline.org. And to learn more about Bechol Lashon, an organization that strengthens Jewish identity by raising awareness about the ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity of Jewish identity and experience, please visit them at globaljews.org.